Um, thank you very much. It's lovely to see lots of familiar faces. And uh, I was given today, and I think I should thank uh, Tansri, Dr. Yusuf, for suggesting, I suppose, this topic. Uh, it's quite interesting looking at taxes and tariffs. So I'm going to talk about that, and I will say something, as you probably expect, about prices. But uh, I'm going to start off talking about export taxes and import tariffs. And I should just mention, because I have to catch a flight straight after this, sadly I'm going to miss what Dorab's going to say. And it's been agreed that the Q&A for my session can happen straight after I finish, if you have any questions, because then I need to go, I'm afraid. So I'll have to ask Dorab afterwards what he says. I'll send, send him a message. Um, I'm going to start by, as I mentioned, I was asked to talk about export taxes and import tariffs. And in the last 15 months, we've had the change in Indonesia. We've more recently had the realignment of the Indian import tariffs. And I want to show how these affect downstream margins. And I'm going to focus not just on refining, but particularly on refining. But I'll also show you of the impact of the Indonesian taxes on oleochemicals and on biodiesel margins. And I'm going to show you something which I haven't analyzed before, which is how much integrated Indonesian plantations seem even to be discounting the effects of their own export tax system. I will show you how that affects biodiesel prices. I'm going then to look at something which those of you who ever have heard me in recent years will know I like to talk about, which is the price band. The price band linking vegetable oil prices to petroleum prices. And you're going to see that is alive and well. And I will show you where we are in the price band. And I believe that when you, I hope anyhow, when you see my diagrams, you'll understand that the relationship between Petroleum, palm oil, and palm oil stocks is the key to understanding the palm oil price outlook. So let's start with Indonesian export taxes. And what you need to remember, and I think it's not too complicated, is the effect of the export tax should mean that the prices of all products that are exported from Indonesia should inside the Indonesian market be the export price, the FOB price, minus the export tax. And you are undoubtedly familiar with the basic structure in Indonesia, which is the highest export tax is on CPO or CPKO. Then you get the export tax on refined products, which is about half as big. And then you get a much lower export tax on biodiesel and a zero export tax on oleochemicals. So the export taxes decrease as you go further downstream. And by doing it this way, it creates incentives and extra margins for exporters. And I'm going later to show, in the case of biodiesel, I'm going to assume, which I think has been broadly true in the past, that in Indonesia they were taking refined palm oil to process into biodiesel. And so a biodiesel company exporting from Indonesia will buy the palm oil, or they should be buying the palm oil, at the export price minus the export tax. And that gives them a saving on the palm oil. And when they export the biodiesel, they're paying a very much smaller export tax. So if we look at this diagram, this is the estimate going up to this month of the advantage that an Indonesian processor will have over a Malaysian processor since September last year when the export tax began. This is the advantage they get per ton of product. Now, for some of this, it's, you have to make assumptions to do this. I'm assuming, for example, for fatty acid and fatty alcohol, I have made the assumption that the choice of raw material for fatty acid, the balance between palm kernel oil 
and palm oil, and the balance between refined oil and crude oil in Indonesia is exactly the same as the balance in Malaysia. Now, that may not be true, but it's a good assumption. So I'm assuming they use exactly the same inputs as a typical oleochemical company in Malaysia. And I've allowed for the conversion factors from vegetable oil to fatty alcohol or from vegetable oil to fatty acid. And what you can see, and if you remember it was a little while back, we had very high palm kernel oil prices for some time. You can see that for fatty alcohols, the benefit to uh, an Indonesian exporter relying on palm kernel oil over a Malaysian exporter became huge, over $300 per ton. If we look at fatty acids, it bounced around a bit, peaked nearly at 200, but is most recently below $100 per ton, the advantage for an Indonesian company over a Malaysian one. Black is refining margins. You can see if you look at the refining margins that recently the benefit to uh, an Indonesian refiner over a Malaysian refiner solely by virtue of the difference between the export taxes on CPO and on refined. And I've treated separately the Olin, the Stearin, and the PFAD. That recently has been about $75 per ton, much more than the refining cost. Blue is for packed oils. And then finally, in green, you can see the advantage for biodiesel. So if in Indonesia, people value the inputs for downstream processing. If they value those inputs at the export price minus the export tax, this is what you can calculate. And you can see it's a big advantage for downstream companies in Indonesia. One point that has often been made to me, so I thought this time, since I was asked to talk about export taxes and import tariffs, I thought I'm going to follow up a comment that's been made to me, which is that when you look at the PME, the palm methyl ester, palm biodiesel price in Europe, the landed price, it seems to be in some way too low. What it appears is that the palm methyl ester price is being sort of discounted more than is necessary purely on account of the export tax saving on refined palm oil. Now, why might people be doing it at a discount? The reason is that if you're an integrated company from plantation to refinery through to biodiesel, maybe you're thinking, my choice is not between exporting refined palm oil or exporting biodiesel. They might be saying to themselves, if I don't export biodiesel, maybe otherwise I would export CPO, which has a much higher export tax. So in effect, the argument put to me is that Indonesian exporters are giving away some of the benefit that they get from the CPO export tax. They're passing that on to the customer. So what I've done here, the red line, is a discount. It is working from the European PME price, taking away the freight to work out what the implied price should have been when exported from Indonesia. And then I've compared it with the published export price of PME from Southeast Asia. And the key point I want you to see is about 12 months ago, this is a moving average, so it's a smooth curve. About 12 months ago, when the revised export tax system was introduced, there was actually a kind of premium, a negative discount. That red line was negative. But with this new export tax system, you can see the red line rises to nearly $70 a ton. What it suggests to me is that on top of the advantage that a Malaysia, an Indonesian biodiesel producer was getting from the saving on export taxes on refined palm oil and comparing it 
with the export tax on biodiesel, they have passed on a big chunk of the saving in export tax on CPO. And being an integrated company, maybe they don't mind doing that. And $70 is the extra disadvantage that Malaysian exporters of biodiesel were facing at the middle of this year. So there is a double whammy for Malaysian companies. One, there is what I showed you in the previous diagram, but on top of that, integrated plantation companies in Indonesia appear to be passing on some of the savings, if you like, on the export tax on CPO to the overseas customer. So what you can deduce is that the problem facing Malaysian exporters is possibly even greater than my first diagram implied. You can do these calculations, and I just showed you the result of the calculation. You discover that Indonesian biodiesel exporters have been willing on occasion to give up as much as $70 per ton of their savings on CPO, passed on into refined palm oil costs, via discounts to European buyers. And there is no way that a Malaysian company can currently compete with those kinds of incentives which the Indonesians can offer their customers, the discounts that they can offer. The other thing which has happened in recent months, as I say, if you can't beat them, join them. India, as I think you know, the tariff value that was being used for palmoline imports was fixed for a very long time at an unrealistically low level by the government to hold down oline prices. But eventually, faced with this competition from Indonesia, the Indian government has raised the tariff value and therefore the import tariff on oline. And it's very interesting. If you look at this diagram, red is the advantage that Indonesia enjoys over Malaysia by virtue of the export tax on refined oils. That's its refining advantage. That was in a previous diagram. Blue is the import tariff on palmoline into India, the protection for Indian refiners. And I'm sure it was by chance rather than design, but you can see that actually the protection in India matches the export incentives in Indonesia. The two are equally balanced. So India has almost exactly matched the benefits that Indonesian refiners by virtue of the export taxes. But India has to do it through import tariffs as an importer. And it's, I'm sure, it just happened that way when they took the Indian tax system and the tariff system and applied the import price of palmoline, it came up giving almost exactly the same value as you get from the Indonesian side through the export taxes. And the losers in all this, once again, are the Malaysian refiners. And clearly, I say your government, many of you are not Malaysian, but the government and the ministry when they were confronted with this challenge and with the record high stocks, they didn't really have much choice but to follow suit with an export tax system which was announced last week. So in terms of export taxes and import tariffs, the bottom line is that it has been a very tough 15 months for Malaysian exporters of downstream products. Through the export tax system, Indonesia is already competitive in downstream products. But what I showed you, and which is why I gave you the example of biodiesel, is actually it appears in the real world that Indian, Indonesia, not Indian, exporters of further downstream products, I suspect it's true of oleochemicals just like I've shown you for biodiesel, they're even willing to discount further than they need to. Rather than exporting refined palm oil and making the trade-off between that and biodiesel, they're actually thinking, 
I've got such big export taxes on CPO, I can give away some of that as a discount on top. So that's the world today. So let's now see what this has done to palm oil prices, and let's see what this has done to stocks and how these all tie together. So I'm going to show you first a very familiar diagram, which is the price band. These are European prices. They're not Southeast Asian prices. At the bottom in blue is the price of petroleum in Europe in dollars per ton, not in dollars per barrel. The brownish line is the CPO price. And the last value is where it was early in October. The green line is rapeseed oil and the red line is soybean oil. And what you see is that the palm oil price has, just like it did in 2008, come very close to the crude oil price. The price band is alive and well. Now, a point you should consider, an obvious point, if palm oil is now more or less at the same price, it's at a slight premium over crude oil in Europe, palm oil is at a discount in Southeast Asia because of the freight. So straight away you can start to see the kind of argument I'm going to be giving. If on an energy value, on a price, palm oil is competitive with petroleum ton for ton in this region, the option of turning palm oil into fuel is becoming a very valid and relevant choice. It's economically competitive without even requiring subsidies. Not in Europe yet, it's starting in Europe, but it's really in this region where palm oil is cheaper than is implied on my diagram. And I maybe should add one other thing. Remember, Indonesia has export taxes on palm oil. So palm oil, inside Indonesia is even cheaper than just subtracting the freight. It will be cheaper by the freight plus the value of the export tax. So when it comes to looking at burning, palm oil is becoming quite competitive inside Indonesia. Because of the price band, what I look at is the premium, the gap between vegetable oil prices and the petroleum price. This is the gap between the Brent price in my previous diagram and soybean oil in red and palm oil in brownish yellow. The premium over Brent crude. And I've done the horizontal lines in blue to show you the average premium for CPO and in green to show you the average premium for soy oil. In the recent price fall, you can see that in a matter of two, three months, the palm has gone from being slightly above average premium over crude oil to virtually zero. It's not quite zero, but it's got very close to zero. And if you look back four years, almost four years to the day, this is where we were in 2008. For soy, it's bounced around a bit, the latest price correction has pulled soy oil below its average premium over crude oil. But this is the effect of the price band. People, someone said to me just before coming in how the correlation doesn't work. It is not a correlation, I will just remind you. If you look at this price band, it's fluctuating within the band. It's not a correlation. And this shows you how much is the fluctuation? But what you must focus your attention on is the band and where you are inside the band. So the implications of the price band in terms of understanding vegetable oil prices are quite powerful. You should be focusing your attention on the differentials between vegetable oil and crude oil prices. And it changes how you look at supply-demand balance. It changes how you look at stocks. But what we can already start to see, and I think Indonesia is going to be the best example when we look back, when we start to get data, when the vegetable oil price in Europe approaches the crude oil price, production of biodiesel, and remember, biodiesel has an export tax from Indonesia, so the internal price is below the world price, 
or the direct burning of vegetable oils, and something like CPO has a big export tax inside Indonesia, they become increasingly attractive options. And that's what creates the floor to the price ban. It's not just statistical. There is a good, strong logic for the floor. When you go the other way, if the premium gets too high, then biofuel demand starts to get cut off. And that creates the ceiling to the price band. And in the past five years, we've seen ceilings. And like in 2008, we are now seeing the floor to the band. But the band is alive and well. So where are you in the band? Well, where you are depends on stocks. And there are some obvious things that are rather special about palm oil in the whole vegetable oil complex. I mean, palm is the biggest oil in terms of volume. It's by far the most heavily exported oil. But that, in my view, isn't why palm is particularly important for price. If you think about something like soybeans, you can grow it in the middle of Brazil and you can crush it 12 months later the other side of the world. You do not crush oil seeds just for the heck of it. You crush it usually when there's a demand for the product. But palm is different. And one of the problems in Indonesia today is that palm is produced every day, is harvested, it has to be milled, it has to go into tanks, and every day there is more palm oil to be sold. It's not like soybean oil, it's not like rapeseed oil, not like sunflower oil, it's something that has to be sold every day. And as the mill tanks fill up, and in addition, of course, it's a 12-month crop. Every month of the year you get more palm oil. The tanks have to be emptied in order for the next day's production. And I always think of palm oil mills as acting like distressed sellers. Every day they have to sell, and they have, to, they have no choice. And that is why it's always a discounted oil, even though in many respects, technically, it's often a better oil, but it has to sell at a discount because it has to be sold every day. And this also, with these high level of stocks and with the high volume of production right now, that explains the sharp drop in price. And I'm going to show you this in terms of the behavior of stocks. This diagram is a good old-fashioned diagram of MPOB stocks, which are the only one the market follows. Those are measured in red on the right-hand side, in thousands of tons. And blue is the CPO price here in Malaysia, the Bursa Malaysia price. And you can see, you can have high stocks like you have today, record stocks, and the price is way above where it was three years, four years ago. Stocks clearly do not determine the price. The relationship is pretty lousy. This is what determines price. Again, I am showing you stocks. Red is MPOB stocks again. This time I've measured it on the left-hand side. Blue is the premium for CPO in Europe over petroleum. And I hope you agree with me, that's a much, much, much better diagram. And in particular, when stocks are very high, and we've now again got record high stocks, the price falls towards the price floor. The price floor being around zero. That is the point when in Southeast Asia, burning of vegetable oils, turning of it into biodiesel for blending with diesel, becomes financially attractive even without any government subsidies. So there is a wonderful inverse relationship, negative relationship. High stocks, low premium. Low stocks, high premium. And this is what I say in the next diagram. When you're trying to analyze uh, the behavior of prices of palm oil in particular, because it's the one oil where you have to hold the surplus as stocks of oil, not as stocks of seed you can see that we start with the price band. You start with petroleum, and then you add the premium. And the premium is inversely related to the stock level. When stocks of oils are low, food users will compete with biofuel 
to pull up the premium. When stocks are high, and now they are record high, the premium falls back up until the point when biofuel demand absorbs that surplus. And the stocks that the market follows are always MPOB stocks. I mean, they're great. They are trusted, and they're produced 10 days after the end of the month. It's about the best indicator you could ever hope for. So MPOB stocks are what drives the market. And to the extent that Indonesia's export taxes have pushed stocks from Indonesia into Malaysia, that has exacerbated the problem, made the stocks even higher in Malaysia. So when we are looking ahead at the short-run prospects for palm oil, the way I like to begin is by looking at the year-on-year -year changes in production, the production cycle, the biological cycle for palm oil. And this is year-on-year -year changes in Malaysian palm oil output, slightly smoothed. August on August, September on September, growth rate in production. First half of this year, there was year-on-year -year decline. But we are now back into the growth phase. And when you look at this, remember that a year ago, if you look just in the second part of last year, that was already a high growth period. So we're having high growth, positive growth, on top of high growth last year. The information we have, we try and collect as much as we can from Indonesia, is that Indonesia, I think, may not even have had a production decline in the first half of this year. With the new areas coming into production, with the maturing of some of the areas planted 2006, 2007 in Indonesia, you're getting a surge in new production from Indonesia. So this cycle for Malaysia you have to add something on it to get a picture of the cycle in Indonesia. So we're coming into a growth period, next two th months or so, three months, in palm oil production year on year, and it'll be even stronger in Indonesia. So when we're looking at the supply side of palm, we know last year was already very good. Everywhere in the world had record production. This year, the weather has been favorable to palm. There are still one or two little lagged effects of dry weather in the past. But basically, the weather has been kind to the oil palm. And because of the lags, we know that the weather is going to be good for palm oil production well into next year. But I think that as I put it there, regardless of the pressures to slow the growth in palm oil expansion, prices have up till right now been so high that I believe the evidence is very clear from Indonesia that maybe not big plantations, maybe not publicly quoted companies, but I do believe that high prices have stimulated plantings in a way that is not fully acknowledged in Indonesia. And I believe that what we're seeing coming out of Indonesia now is good evidence of that. That high prices, it's always the cure for high prices is high prices. It has been encouraging plantings, but it takes time. But we're now starting to see the lagged effects of those boom prices, 2007, 2008. Land was planted, which is coming into production. So we can expect for some time to come an underlying rapid growth and rising wave of palm oil output. In the background, we have soy oil. Soy oil, here I'm just plotting for you the soy oil premium over palm oil. It, you can see we're not yet back where we were in 2008, but if you look along this diagram, this is now the second highest peak. The market is signaling plentiful supplies of palm oil, lack of supply of soybean oil, and so we have this high premium for soy over palm. So, if we're looking, and this is my concluding side, I'll just say one or two words beyond this, but 
If we're trying to understand export taxes, which I was asked to talk about, vegetable oil stocks and vegetable oil prices, first of all, of course, events here are tied to events in Indonesia. And I believe there is very compelling evidence of strong production growth in Indonesia. And with the tax changes, they are exporting refined oils that are traditionally the province of Malaysia and putting pressure, therefore, on stocks in Malaysia, raising them. Your government is now responding to this. And I believe that the reform, which will only take effect next year, but the reform plus, and I think I should stress it as the major factor right now, biofuel demand, which is price sensitive because palm has now become cheap as a fuel. It's a cheap transport fuel. It's a cheap fuel oil for burning in this region, especially in Indonesia because of the export tax, which makes it even cheaper inside Indonesia. This is not only eventually, not so long from now, going to stop the rise in stocks, but it'll start as people look a little bit ahead, markets look a bit ahead, start, I think, my guess is by December to start to pull up the premium for palm oil over Brent crude. There is a flaw which is created by petroleum. There is a flaw created by biofuels and we are now getting down to that level. At the same time, we are coming into, or with normal weather, a superb South American soybean crop. If you go to South America, if you go to Brazil, I was there about two months ago. I've never seen such happy farmers as the Brazilian soybean farmers. And they get double cropping. They do soybean, then maize. They've got record maize prices, followed by record soybean prices. They've locked in, they've sold forward, their currency is weak. All being well, Brazil will produce more soybeans this coming year than the United States. Maybe when we look back, this will be like it was when Indonesia overtook Malaysia. South America, especially Brazil, are becoming world number one soybean producer. So as that starts to happen, I believe the soy palm spread will narrow. Mainly, I suspect, by palm moving up above the floor. But in the background, we have petroleum. Well, it's more than in the background. In the foreground, it's the most important thing of all because that is where the floor is. And everything I see about the petroleum market just confirms my feeling more and more supply coming on, people now seriously talking of the U.S. becoming self-sufficient in crude oil within 10 years because these prices are developing new reserves, resources in the U.S. Eventually, the crude price must fall back. It's just a question of when it falls back. And so if I were in your position, especially plantation owners planning ahead, I feel you have to be prepared for this eventual correction in the petroleum price. And palm is now tied to it via the price band. You cannot escape from it. Biofuel supports the floor, but biofuel also keeps it within the band, stops it going above the ceiling. So you're now following the petroleum price. So I've said more than enough, I think. There's a picture of a soybean, if you want to see one. Um, so, soybean plant. So, uh, I believe I'm allowed to take one or two questions before I have to leave for the airport. So, thank you very much.